This evening, I am going to, as I, as I promised from last week, to dive into the depths uh, of the red heifer sacrifice. And for some of you, that might even be the first time you ever even heard that word before, the red heifer sacrifice, or maybe you've heard it, but it's oh, that's a, kind of archaic, and isn't that Old Testament stuff? Well, I'm going to show you how much of the front of the book we don't read that, that uh, really paralyzes us from understanding the back of the book. Because remember, most all of the back of the book, all of the back of the book was written by Hebrews. Every one of them were Jews of the very first century, and uh, some of them were even rabbis, like Paul. Paul was a rabbi, and his name obviously in Hebrew was Rabbi Shaul. And so if, if these are rabbis and, and, and Jewish men uh, that grew up as boys in, in, in a Jewish cycle, so of li- cycles of life in a Hebrew society, and we don't understand their nomenclature, their idiomatic expressions, their vocabulary, and their cycles of life, which are biblical, the biblical cycles, the feast days, if we do not understand uh, the feast days of our Lord and the sacrifices that are found in the Tanakh, they called the scriptures, we're not going to understand really hardly anything found in the New Testament because the New Testament is simply the Old Testament revealed and the Old Testament is simply the New Testament concealed. Okay, so we are going to dive into the concealment part uh, of the scriptures this evening, and we will bridge across the gap into the New Testament near the end. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clarify a couple things that I mentioned last week about clean and unclean. And I want you to understand a little bit of what clean and unclean is, because quite frankly, virtually all of the Bible has to deal, has to do with this concept of clean and unclean. Okay, and so literally I could spend an hour uh, giving a message and a teaching on just this topic alone. I'm going to scratch the surface and wet your taste buds to, stu- your taste buds to study for yourself uh, to see if you can pull some more nuggets out. But the Hebrew word for clean is tehor, okay? Tehor is clean and tame is unclean. I'm sorry if your name is Tommy, okay? Uh, your name originally means unclean. Um, not really, but Tame is unclean and Tehor is clean, okay? And why is that important? Tehor is, I would just give it an idea, clear and open manifestation of God is Tehor, okay? Now, when we hear clean and unclean, in American lingo, we think of dirty and not dirty, do we not? And when we think of dirty, we think of something that is unuseful or something that we sh- you should stay away or even evil we might connect with it. Okay, when we say an unclean spirit, okay, obviously that's an evil spirit. But we don't have any other word to put before evil spirit than an unclean evil spirit. But that is different from clean and unclean. You can have a clean and unclean, you can be clean and unclean ceremonially and have nothing to do with an evil spirit. So first of all, I want to absolutely uh, make that abundantly clear, that just because you are clean or unclean in Old Testament times, does not mean that you were had a good spirit or an evil spirit. It simply meant that something was unclean. Very much similar to, if I could use an analogy, of a dish, a dirty dish. Simply means that it's dirty. It's not useful at that moment for eating off of. Okay, You must clean it first before you can put it before the king. And that is very similar to the concept of clean and unclean. On Tehor is, is, I want you to kind of think of an open manifestation of Yahweh, meaning that it, the doors of the temple are open for business and you have the opportunity for Yahweh to manifest himself. It's very clear when you're clean. When you're clean, it is clear, okay? In other words, you can see clear and the, and the opportunity for Yahweh to minister to you in your life is at the highest. Tame is closed doors, okay? The analogy of closed doors of the temple Uh, It's hidden. The manifestation of the Creator is completely hidden from sight. The largest sacrifices that were done uh, in ancient Israel, as we're going to talk about and and zone in on the red heifer sacrifice, the doors had to be open before the face of Yahweh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So when you're dealing with clean and unclean, uh, I want you to think of it as open and closed, okay? It's not life and death. Like many of us kind of kind of get the, the American you know, Christian idea of what clean and unclean it is. It's life and the removal of life. You see, in a Greek mindset, it's life and death. We have a life and death situation. But in a Hebrew mindset, there is never, never, ever, and I stress never, 
a, a emphasis on death, ever. Did I say that enough? Okay. We do not emphasize death as Hebrews. The biblical mindset, the Hebraic mindset, is that you always emphasize life. So even when you say, I'm repenting from my sin, you're not turning your back on sin. You are turning your face back towards Yahweh. Okay? There is never you give the enemy. He is the God of this world. There's no question about that. So he has the credit of the one starting and stirring all of the trouble. But we always speak in positives as towards moving towards the light, not away from the darkness. Is that making sense? By default, you are moving away from darkness, but a Hebrew mindset is always in the positive. And so when we look at life and death, it is life and the removal of life. Now, practically, Jim, how does that make sense? Here's how it makes great sense. Which is more unclean? A dead dog, a dead pig, a dead human being, or a dead cow? Any guesses? What is more unclean? Shoot them out. I can't hear you. They're all the same. Mark. Very good. It is a dead human being. Why? Absolutely. That's very good. He said that the reason why a dead human being is the most unclean out of those four choices is because the human being has the greatest opportunity for life. So when the life is removed from a human being, it creates what? A vacuum for death. So there is more death inside of a human being that dies because it has a greater capacity for life. Now you say, Jim, well, what, what does that have anything to do with anything? It has everything to do with everything that we're going to be talking about this evening because, because of the death of human beings. That's why there is such thing as a red heifer sacrifice. You might say, well, what is a red heifer sacrifice? We're going to talk about that. The whole reason why Yeshua came was not because to raise a cow. It wasn't to raise a pig or a dog from the dead. It was to raise real human beings from the dead. And all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is what? Death. All right. We have a big problem, according to the Torah, if you have death. Because if you have death in your life, you are unclean at the highest level. There is no other uncleanness that even comes close to the death of a human being. This problem has to be solved, and we're going to solve it this evening. Here we go. The greater void, just to give you another example of, of, uh, of clean and unclean and, and, the, and the void here of the lack of life, is how about a son or a daughter? Now, I have absolutely no clue about sons, as you know. I don't have sons. I have five of the pink ones on the right. Uh, but here's a strange Torah commandment. Some of you know uh, where I'm going to go with this, but a strange Torah commandment says when a woman has a baby boy, she's unclean for how long? Seven days, and then she is, continues in her uncleanness for 33 days, okay, or her, her, her uh, sanctified in her purity, days of impurity for another 33 days for a total of 40 days, but if she has a girl, she's unclean for how long? Two weeks and then a total of 80 days, so twice as long. And the sages for, for centuries, probably, you know, uh, playing poker in the middle of the night, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what does this mean? You know, uh, how, why is it that, it's, that the woman is unclean for twice as long having a girl uh, as a boy? I mean, they're both the same. They're both child, children, so on and so forth. But see, understanding the concept of clean and unclean, we recognize that it's not good and bad. It's not life and death. A woman has the capability of holding life within her. Does she not? Who has the greater capacity of life, a male or a female? A female. A female has the greater capacity of life because she has not only the ability to carry her own life, but she has the ability to progenate life inside of her. She has the ability to have twice as much life. Is this making sense? So when a woman has a child that is a baby girl, she is taking out from her a woman 
that has the capability of having a child inside of her. Does that make sense? And so from a clean and unclean, the greater void is a female child because a female child has the ability to progenate more life. It's a larger void. It's twice the void. So that's why there's twice the uncleanness. Does that make sense at all? I know that was kind of like, you can hit rewind on the DVD player later. Okay. So, all right. So I, want, I just wanted to go through that a little bit so you can kind of set up and understand the concept of clean and unclean because this entire chapter that we're going to go through in depth is related to these two words. Okay. The red heifer and the prophetic significance for today. By the time we get done with this message, you're going to understand why we are at the end of time unequivocally. That we are, we are nearing quickly to the end of days. It's all related to the red heifer. We can look at the signs in the heavens. We can look at all the political and the geopolitical things that are happening in, in Israel today. Uh, we can look at sin in America. We can look at all kinds of things. But ultimately, there's only one single thing that begins the end of days. And it is this guy right here. So we need to discuss this and find out a little bit about how it works. We are going to start off in Nehemiah chapter... No, we're not going to start there. I got the wrong one up here. We're going to start in Numbers chapter 19. So if you want to turn to your Bibles with me, that's where we're going to start. Probably going to skip around a little bit here because I have a lot to go through in a little bit amount of time. Now Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which Yahweh has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. Now, what does that mean? That simply means, uh, according to the, the, uh, the Mishnah and the rabbis and all of the traditions, what they did for thousands of years, is if they found two single white hairs on that heifer, it would disqualify that heifer. It had to be 100% or up to one hair, but it had to be virtually 100% red. It had to be totally red. The hoofs even had to be red. So if you had a completely red heifer with black hooves, it wouldn't work. It had to be totally 100% red. There could have no defect whatsoever. One single boil, one single wart, anything on that heifer could disqualify it from being a red heifer sacrifice. If there was ever a yoke that was placed on this uh, heifer, it would completely dis uh, disqualify it. Matter of fact, if you put a blanket on a red heifer, it would disqualify it from being the red heifer. Why? Because it's carrying something. It went as far as if you leaned on the red heifer, it would totally disqualify that red heifer. Because the red heifer would have to resist you and therefore it is working. The only thing that you could do is you could, do, you could lead it, you could put a, a rope around it if it was for the benefit of the life to save the life of that red heifer or to bring it to a place that was in its best interest, okay? The red heifer, I cannot stress to you how significant this animal is in ancient Israel. They have only sacrificed seven, at the most nine. There's a discrepancy. Most scholars say seven, uh, some say nine. But seven red heifers in the history of the world. You're going to realize why it's only been, because quite frankly, it's really difficult to find a red heifer that meets the qualifications uh, to be able to do what it needs to do. So before we actually continue, uh, continue to, to dive into this subject, we're going to discuss the mountains of Israel. I want you to see from a bird's eye view exactly what Jerusalem looks like, because how many of you have heard of the Mount of Olives, Mount Moriah, and Mount Zion? But we don't really know where those are. We know they're in Israel somewhere, and they're all throughout the Bible, but until you actually see on a map kind of where these, these, uh, these mountains are at, it's, it's difficult to kind of figure out in your head where they're at. So here, here's how it works. Number one, or excuse me, number two, that is Mount Moriah. That is where the Temple Mount is. You can see the square uh, Temple Mount. That is where the Temple Mount is in the center today, of, obviously, is the Dome of the Rock, which won't be there when the Messiah comes back, I promise. Uh, but to the right of the Mount Moriah, 
uh, you will see that green line that runs right up through number one and number two. That is the Kidron Valley. Number one, number one is the Mount of Olives, okay? So on the far right, you see the Mount of Olives. In the center, you have Mount Moriah. And on the left, you have Mount Sion. Now, Mount Sion, in, uh, some people call it Mount Zion, uh, but it's pronounced Mount Sion. And Mount Sion, uh, in, the, in the Hebrew Scriptures, all throughout the Bible, is synonymous with really all of Israel, all of Jerusalem, can be called Mount Sion, okay? So it's not like the Greek thinking of Mount Sion, Mount Moriah, Mount of Olives. Because if you notice, where is the Mount of Olives? How many were like me before I researched things and, and began to ask questions, thought Mount of Olives was a mountain? Okay? I did. I thought the Mount of Olives was a single mountain. I did not know that it was a mountain range that runs that entire side of the picture there. And so the Mount of Olives is that entire area. It wasn't just one single mountain like we have here in the United States. It's a much flatter terrain over there. And so you have the entire terrain of the Mount of Olives over there. So this is going to be important. I want you to take a quick picture in your brain because we're going to come back to this. Okay, next, what I want you to understand from this next photo uh, is something that, that is, uh, and, I, and I really wish I had a photo of the actual uh, Temple Mount today. But most of you know what the Temple Mount looks like. You have the Dome of the Rock. And then you have the, uh, uh, the synagogue, the, Mus the, uh, the, the Muslim Islamic synagogue on the uh, southeastern, uh, the southern side of the Temple Mount. And there's a discrepancy because right where the yellow is, okay, that's where the, the mosque is, or excuse me, not the mosque, the, uh, the Dome of the Rock is. Now this is a, a, a topographical map. What's a topographical map? It shows us the elevation changes. The closer the lines are together, the steeper the hill. And then it always ends up with a circle showing us where the very top of the mountain is. Now, in ancient Israel, in ancient Israel, what happened is, is the way that they built cities or they built uh, uh, castles or, 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 or uh, structures where they're going to put their city is they would go to the top of the hill and they literally would cut the top of the hill off and uh, they would use that to shore up uh, a lower side of the hill. And they would normally put the castle... Uh, not at the very top of the hill, but right near the top, right below the top, okay? Now, without going into all of the, the proof text for what I just said, how many remember in their Bibles when it says that the, the enemies of Israel would sacrifice to their idols on the high places in Israel? Remember that? All throughout the Bible, the high places. The high places are at the very top. Okay, very top. That's at the very top. You see the, uh, go back to the slide there, but you, you can see the very top where the yellow is, that's at the very top of the hill. Never in Israel where you see a temple or a, a synagogue that's placed on the top of a hill. Never. They're, they're not there. They are always, if you go to the top of the hill, the way that you'll find a synagogue in archaeology, I've been there, I've been on some of these things, is you just go three-quarter of the way down. Begin to circle around the top of the mountain, and that's where you're going to find your synagogues. The, guess where the Greek gods and goddesses were found? Guess where their temples were found? Guess where the high places to Ashtaroth and Baal were found? On the high places, the very top of the mountain. Now what you're seeing right here is a very interesting picture because this is uh, infrared. Okay, and I'm going to show you this in a little bit more. Actually, I think the next picture. Yes, Tuvia Sagiv is an architect that lives in in uh, Israel. He lives in Tel Aviv. And what he did was he didn't buy the idea that the temple uh, was actually built over the, uh, the Dome of the Rock. And because he believes that God is smarter than that. And so what he decided to do, and I have no idea how he got the permission to do this, but he actually flew over uh, the Temple Mount in a helicopter and shot infrared waves over the Temple Mount. Now what is infrared? Infrared picks up heat uh, it, through radiation. So the hot sun will beat down on the Temple Mount and heat up all of the rock, okay? But when it begins to cool, the more solid pieces of rock will maintain more heat than, the, than the, just the regular dirt. And so right after sunset, flying over the Temple Mount, you began to f literally begin to see something that was incredible, which was this picture that I just showed you is that this yellow pentagon here 
is right around the Dome of the Rock, meaning that there is no Hebrew synagogue or temple, for that matter, found in the Torah that Yahweh told his people to make in the form of an octagon, okay, or a pentagon. And so in this, we know for a fact through history that the goddess Ashtaroth, the Phoenician goddess, which is pronounced Easter today, uh, where we get Easter from, is uh, there, her temples, guess what the shape of her temple was? This shape, okay? In first century uh, Judea, in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount was not as large as it was. It was all the way back, almost half of what it was today, and then it was added on by the Hasmonean dynasty after that in the 140s, okay? And so what we have is literally, uh, we have the temple, you see the red part there, that's the holy place and the holy of holies. Guess what he found in infrared? The foundations of the real temple. It is not over the Dome of the Rock. There's no need to remove the Dome of the Rock because the real original second temple is built right in between the synagogue that's on the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock. And so if ever uh, the politic uh, changes in Israel and uh, the Jewish people barter for the Temple Mount, they don't need to destroy either the synagogue or the mosque. They can build right on the foundations of the temple. Isn't that incredible? Yahweh is good, and He's good all the time. So I wanted to show you that, uh, that the high places are always on the top, synagogues and temples are always right below that. Okay? All right, let's move forward and get into Nehemiah's temple to show you something. This is a rendition of Nehemiah's temple of what it would look like all the way back in the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah obviously was a leader of Israel that came back and decided, you know what, uh, as a minor prophet, we need to shore up the walls of Israel. We need to begin to rebuild the walls of Israel. What did he do? He had a sword in one hand, and what did he have in the other? A Torah scroll in the other. It's by the word uh, and by the testimony is how the power is going to be there. And so this is Nehemiah's temple. This is what it looked like. This is the, basically the same picture that you have, except we have the gates. Now I want you to turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 3. We're going to set this whole thing up. If you didn't bring your Bible, I would encourage you to bring your Bible because it is your sword. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. This is the beginning process where each family chose to rebuild Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem. Now, what's incredible about this is that this did not happen by, you know, subcontracting out to the Egyptians, you know, or calling the local, you know, contractor down the road that's been there, one of the Phoenicians or the Canaanite or the Jebusite, uh, you know, people. These were families that belonged to the tribes of Israel that said, I want to see Israel grow again, and they invested their own time, their own talent, and their own money to rebuild the walls. These are people that, that were invested with their lives. This was their city. And so I wanted to start off by this, is, is showing you that they started out with the sheep gate. Everybody see the sheep gate at the very top, right? Very top right-hand corner. And then he begins, and I'm not going to read it to you for the sake of time. It goes all the way around counterclockwise, and he ends up in verse 31. He says, after him, Mal Malchiah, one of the goldsmiths made repairs as far as the house of Nethanim and of the merchants in front of the inspection gate. As far as the upper room at the corner and between the upper room at the corner, which corner? Top right corner. As far as the sheep's gate. So what happens? It begins with the sheep gate and it ends with the sheep gate. That should mean something for those of you that believe in Messiah as being the Lamb of Yahweh. The beginning starts with Him, and the end ends with Him. But what's very interesting is right before you get to the second time that the Sheep Gate is mentioned. First time Sheep Gate is mentioned, uh, figuratively, is Genesis. That is the beginning of creation. The Word created. The Lamb of Yahweh, the Word of God, created the heavens and the earth. The second time that He comes to visit this earth is the second time that the Sheep Gate is mentioned. 
So prophetically, what's interesting is we need to find out what is the gate right before the sheep gate because that is going to be the last prophetic gate to open. And it's called the inspection gate. Now there's so much that is packed in here that I could talk for hours on, folks, because every story that's found in the Scriptures in the Tanakh and what we call the Old Testament is designed for, to show what? Reveal sin invite you, showed them in, in, in Egypt, invited them out for 40 years, what happened? They went through all the gates and they were inspected at the very end before they crossed the River Jordan. Were they not? They were inspected and they fell short. They could not go into the final sheep gate, the second coming of the Messiah, if you will, the promised land. Right before the very end, my friends, we will be inspected. Now let's find out what the word inspected here is in Hebrew because this is really going to be spectacular. The word inspection. So we want to focus on the inspection gate. The word here is mifkad. All right? Everybody say mifkad. All right. Mifkad. Now you speak Hebrew. You didn't know. You could do that. Mifkad. What does mifkad mean? It's Strong's number 4662. Never believe me. Always look it up for yourself. Uh, so you know that I'm not copy and pasting something else just to make a point. From Strong's, it comes from Strong 6485. Whenever you see that, that means that there is a, it's a longer word. Mifkat, I believe, is a four-letter uh, root word, a Hebrew word, and it can be broken down into a three-letter foundational root. So that's what it means when it says from Strong's number, which is pakad, all right? Pakad means to count, okay? Pakad means to count an appointment, mandate, a designated spot, specifically a census or a number. So does that make sense why they called it the inspection gate? Because the inspection gate is the gate that they counted. They inspected something. It was an appointment, a designated spot. It was specifically the, 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 the gate of the census. Okay? Prophetically, it's incredible because right before Yahweh comes back in the, it, with his son, what happens? We are going to be coming through the gate, and he is going to inspect us. There is going to be a census, and what does he say what he's going to do? What do the prophets say? He's going to divide the sheep, in, or the, the people, into sheep and goats. Sheep and goats. It is the inspection gate. So continue with me, because this is going to get pretty amazing. This is another rendition of uh, uh, Nehemiah's temple, or Nehemiah's Jerusalem. And I wanted to show you, if you look very carefully there, we see where it says the temple that's where the temple was actually located, all right? Where was the, uh, the Mifkad gate located? The Mifkad gate was located right here, just north and just east of the gate. Now, if you know anything about the Torah, what is, I believe it's Leviticus, and I believe it's chapter 1, uh, verse 11, uh, but I, don't quote me on that. I believe it says that if you're going to sacrifice a heifer, all right, or these animals, they are to be north of the altar. So they would sacrifice the animals. They would kill the animals north of the altar before they put them on the altar. This is going to be important when we get to the red heifer sacrifice. So from the Mifkad gate, there was a line or a bridge, a three-tiered bridge that went over the Kidron Valley over to our green Mount of Olives, okay? Here's maybe a little better picture of that, just kind of a little artist rendering of what it might have looked like. Now, why would they build a bridge going from the Mifkad gate all the way over to the Mount of Olives to sacrifice the red heifer? Is because according to the Torah, you could not touch anything dead or you would be unclean. Well, the, the Mount of Olives and the Kidron Valley is where all kinds of thousands of of uh, tombs are and cemeteries and the bones of dead people and so you were not allowed to cross over a grave or you would become unclean ceremonially unclean why because when you cross something that is when you touch something that's dead or you you touch a dead body or a dead bone or you walk over something that is unclean you are coming in contact with death and Yahweh is all about restoring people back to the garden, which is life. Is this making sense? This is why the whole point of Yeshua coming to begin with. So they would walk over all of that, not touching anything, so that they could get to the, what they called in the Scriptures a clean place. All right. So now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 21. 
to me, this is just amazing. Now, I, I remember I'm a professional kindergartner, so I get excited easily. Uh, but chapter 43, verse 21 says this, Thou shalt take the bullock also of the sin offering, and he shall burn it in the appointed place of the house without the sanctuary. What's without the sanctuary? Meaning outside of the temple, uh, the walls of Jerusalem, okay? Not very many things had to be burned outside of the wall of Jerusalem. Things that dealt with death, the, the, the leprosy, uh, the man who had leprosy was dealt with outside. The priest had to go outside of the walls of Jerusalem, okay? And there was a couple other things. This one was one of them. The red heifer had to be without the sanctuary at the appointed place. Guess what the word in Hebrew is for appointed place? It is mifkah. Anyway, so that's just, that's, okay, that's good. What, what does that mean? It means everything because this tells us that it was the mifkad or the appointed gate that was used for the high priest and the priest that would follow him to take the bull, the red heifer, and they would walk it out. It would get inspected at the mifkad gate, and they would take it across, one last inspection, and take it across to the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. It is the mifkad gate. Now we're going to cruise back to Exodus chapter 38, verse 25 and 26, and we're going to connect something here. Exodus 38, 25 says, and the silver of them, uh, he's giving instructions here, and you can read the context later if you'd like, but for the sake of time, we're just going to start off in verse 25, and the silver of them that were numbered of the congregation was a hundred talents, and a thousand seven hundred and three score and fifteen shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary, and they're going through and they're numbering all the men of Israel. What is it? If you number the men of Israel, what is that called? That's right. How many had people in the last year or two come to your house and ask you how many people lived in your house or got something in the mail, right? That's what we do even in today's world. They want to take a census. Well, that word numbered here in Hebrew is pakad. Pakad. It's to, to number. Now, Let's go to verse 26 because it gets even more interesting. So now we're back to the Pakad gate, okay? Which, remember, Pakad was the foundational word from our original Mifkad gate. Here we go. A becca for every man, that is a half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. This is where it gets interesting because now we've established that the red heifer was taken out of the Mifkad gate across the Kidron Valley and sacrificed on the Mount of Olives, which we'll continue to go through in just a moment. But now in Exodus, it's talking about a becca for every man. It's in the census. What is the word that's connected? Because we have a census, a numbering system, and we have the man that we're going to number. At the end of time, every man will be numbered. So what is the word man here in Hebrew? See, we have to go back to the original. We're going to miss everything. And we just start throwing around these English words because the, the word in Hebrew here is gogolet. It's a skull. By implication, a head or a pole. It means every man, like counting. By the first century, this particular place was called Golgotha. It is not a skull a mountain that looks like a skull. It is not a rock that looks like a skull. It's not a little pole with a skull on it. It has nothing to do with, this, with a skull. It is the idea of counting your skull. Okay? As you golf, as, as in the Old Testament when they did the tithe, they, the, the, the animals would come underneath the rod and it was the tenth one. Maybe they hit it right on the skull, but it was the skull, that was what it's talking about, the gogolet, all right, the skull of a man that was counted. And so when they did the census, doesn't it make sense, no pun intended, that that's where they would count the men, because that's where you come in, the Mount of Olives, you have the Mifkad gate, that is the census gate, the numbering gate, and that is the gate that is clean, and that is the gate where, uh, where it's very close to the gate of the city. And so everyone is numbered, or the census was taken through that gate. And so doesn't it make sense to you and to me, I think it does, that Yeshua, it says, was, was crucified, we know, on, at Golgotha, but all these people were coming by, and they had the ability to see him. 
How could that be? Because that was the main place where people came by of the road of the census. It was a very well-traveled uh, place uh, that was uh, right in the way to getting into Jerusalem, and everyone would have seen the crosses that were right there. They were done in that clean place. We'll go more through that a little bit, but I want you to see that connection. Uh, to me, I don't know about you, but to me, that's an incredible connection to see how Gogolet is connected to a man at a census and a poll has nothing to do. All of these scholars, believe it or not, it's all over the internet. All these scholars and all these people over the last 50 years have been looking for the place of the skull, assuming that that means that, that they called it this place of the skull for the geographical or the geological uh, formation of the earth. It has nothing to do with that. It's simply that's where they counted the skulls. Can you imagine if Paul or any Hebrew was alive today, how much they would go, oy vey. <laughs> These Americans, they're my, back to my Pakistani and Hebrew accent. <laughs> All right, let's cruise back to Numbers, chapter 19. Kind of all over this evening, but we want to establish some patterns here. In verse 4, it says this, And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. So here's what happened. And uh, for the sake of time, I was going to read this whole thing. There's no way I'm going to be able to do that with the little amount of time that I have. So I'm just going to kind of tell the story. What they would do is they would take the red heifer, they would cross the gate, uh, across the Kidron Valley, and they had a place that was clean. Now, when you hear of a clean uh, a tomb in the Scriptures or a clean place, what that meant, it was newly hewn rock, okay? Because rock was not porous. It was the clay that was porous. And so if it was newly hewn and there was no graves in the vicinity, that would be called a clean place, okay? Uh, and they would, they would paint it white and so on and so forth. Uh, by the way, uh, it's coming to me, remember when Yeshua says, you whitewashed tombs who look so beautiful on the outside, is because their tombs that they would build were beautiful. They would hew them out of rock, paint them white, and they sparkled clean. Now, what's, But they had dead bones on the inside. Now what's interesting is, guess where all the rich men's graves were in Israel? If you were rich, guess where your tomb would be? On the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is where the rich men would be. And some of you might know that there was a rich man that gave up his tomb for a richer man. All right, so Numbers 19.4, he sprinkled. So they would take this red heifer, and they would put it on the Mount of Olives. And so now pretend this is the Kidron Valley here. And, uh, and, and Brandon, you are the temple, okay? Temple of the Holy Spirit, you didn't know. So we're going to build a bridge across here. And what I would do is I would take this, this heifer. Anybody want to volunteer to be a heifer? Okay, I didn't think so. All right, we'll pretend we have a heifer up here, and what we would do is we would take this heifer and we would face it due west towards the, east, towards the temple, into the eastern gate, and, the, and we, would, we would strap it down, and the head of the cow would be looking directly at Brandon, at the temple, okay? Then what they would do is they would open up the doors of the temple, they would slaughter the animal, they would, uh, they would, they would kill the, the heifer, and then they would take... Uh, they would take uh, and, and light it on fire. They would begin to burn the pro they would In that process, they would burn. Then they would take hyssop, they would take cedar wood, and they would wrap it in scarlet wool and throw it on top of the fire. Now, anybody in their right mind would go, this is a witch's brew. This is bizarre. You know, I mean, now we know uh, where half the world got their strange ideas of how to do strange concoctions, right? Not so fast. There's a reason for everything that's found in your Bible. Everything that happens is for a reason. The sprinkling, what they would do is out of his left hand, right hand, they would cut and slice the throat. Left hand, they grabbed the blood, and he would have the blood in his left hand. Then he would take his index finger of the right hand, dip it into his left hand, and seven times he would sprinkle it towards the front of the sanctuary, towards the doors. Because the Mount of Olives is about 200 feet over Mount Moriah, over the temple, it was very easily seen. You could easily see inside the temple doors. 
So where does that come in? That comes in when we move to Numbers 19.4. It's connected to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. It says, For the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the appearing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We're going to come back to that verse at the very end, but I wanted to bring it up and connect it immediately that we're talking about the Messiah. The entire red heifer is about the Messiah. It is a ceremonial process of cleansing all of Israel from the fact that they are dead men, And Yeshua is going to do the same thing, once and for all. What's so incredible to me about this particular sacrifice is that Yeshua is taking the place of not just the red heifer sacrifice. He dies when? When does he die? What feast day does he die? He dies right there in the feast of Passover, during the feast of unleavened bread. He's born in a manger that's in a Levitical barn that they raised the Azazel goat for Yom Kippur. So he, he's connected to the Yom Kippur sacrifice, which atones for the sin of all of Israel. He's connected with the death of the firstborn of the Passover, rectifying the, the death of Adam, the sin of Adam. Because remember it says that, that through Adam, all sin entered into the world. But through the second Adam, Yeshua, life entered into the world. He couldn't have died on any other, uh, connected to any other feast day than Passover, because Passover is the redemption of the firstborn. You see a pattern here. There's one left sacrifice that's critical, and that's the red heifer sacrifice. Because not only are we going to redeem the firstborn, not are we going to redeem us from sin, but now we have to make us clean to be able to put the white robes on to stand before Yahweh when Yeshua comes back. You can't be a priest that's set free from the law of death, that's been sanctified as a firstborn, and not have a white robe. Because you can only get a white robe when? When you are mikvahed through the pool of Siloam and you come out on the other side, you are considered ceremonially clean and you are now qualified to wear the white robe. Being clean from death is everything. And see, because we we grew up in religious circles that don't understand the difference between clean and unclean and really in life and death, we don't totally get why Jesus died. He didn't die just to redeem the firstborn. He didn't die just for your sins. He died as the red heifer sacrificed so that you could have the right to put on that robe because you can't put it on with just a Passover sacrifice and you can't put it on just because there's a Yom Kippur sacrifice that is qualified for you. You must be mikvahed. And it happens through water. What's interesting about the red heifer sacrifice, not done with our story, as soon as it's all done, they would burn it to the ground and then they would beat it with hammers and with uh, uh, their, their stone uh, that they would beat the, 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 all the way down to the animal till it was ashes. Then they would take these ashes and they would put them in a clean place. And after three days, they would take the ashes and they would mix it with water. So let's make some connections here. Because I, 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 I could really spend an hour going through more of this story. But I want to make some connections as we move along through here. The red heifer was watched until its third year. Did you know that? Once they had a qualified red heifer, they would watch that red heifer for three years. Now, why would you do that? Because they had to make sure that this was a qualified red heifer and not just premature. Did you know that there was a red heifer born in 1997? There was one born in 2002. Did you know both of those were disqualified? It was all over the news. See, if we have an ear for this, you will know when a red heifer is born in Israel because it makes major news over there. It buzzes the internet like crazy because if there's a red heifer, they know for a fact, in the, even in their Mishnah, in, in, in the writings of the rabbis, they say that the next red heifer is the one that will bring the Messiah. Even the unbelieving Jews, our southern brother, knows that the next red heifer is the one that will bring about the third temple, which they know, according to the Torah and the prophets, brings about the Messiah. So if you knew this, you would celebrate too if there was a red heifer that was born that would qualify. But they have not had one that has qualified. Yeshua was watched for three years of his ministry. If you ever wonder why he had three-year ministry. He had to have a three-year ministry. He could not have any less than a three-year ministry because according to the Torah, the red heifer had to be watched for three years to make sure. 
How many remember the night before Yeshua died, what happened? They brought him before the high priest, right? Guess where that was? Guess where they had to go through right before he took him to, to Calvary? Had to go through that Mithkod gate. The counting, the time where they, it was the last time to, to check and find out where. Something else is coming to you that's amazing. Um, see, I studied all this stuff and there's no way to put it in a note, so it, it goes in a file and I trust the Ruach will bring it out at some point. <laughs> One thing will qualify Yeshua, disqualify him as a red heifer. What is one of the requirements for, for a red heifer is if you put any yoke on that red heifer, it is disqualified. Once it is qualified, it can be disqualified from that moment if there's a yoke put on it. Does anybody remember this little guy named Simon? What did he do? Carried the cross. Guess where he started carrying the cross? Right at the gate. It was at the gate, and they didn't have a clue. That's where he fell, was at the gate. He fell, and in and, and the spiritual realm is the last counting. From Yahweh's perspective, that's it. He caused his own son to fall that third time, and he was, by that moment, why did he fall? Because he knew that he would put on the hearts of those that are around him and the leadership to take that beam off of the red heifer because it would disqualify him once he crosses that line. He walks then across that Kidron Valley, and that is where uh, our story will continue to pick up. This is so amazing to me. So must be acquired. The red heifer must be acquired through money from the temple treasury. Did you know that? This is not a, a, a sacrifice that you brought. This is a sacrifice that is purchased by the temple treasury. The location of Yeshua was paid for from the temple treasury to Judas, 30 pieces of silver. That red heifer was purchased by the temple. Isn't that amazing? Yes. We're only in the beginning. It must be without blemish or defect, or we can say today, we say sin. Yeshua clearly with, was without blemish, any kind of defect, any kind of sin. He qualified in that way. But let me ask a question. Why would it be a white heifer? Why wouldn't it be a white heifer? Now, see, I remember, I, I, I think strange things. And I ask all kinds of questions. I always got in trouble because I always made the class stay late because Jim Stead was always the one asking questions. Shut, Jim, stop. You're killing us. Every time you ask a question, we get more homework. But I asked this question in my studies to, to, to the father. I said, wait a minute. If it's without sin, everyone knows in the Bible that sin is connected to what color? Red. Gotcha. Okay. Red first, then black. Black is death. Sin is connected to red or crimson. So why on earth, if it's without blemish, would this not be a white cow, an albino cow? In my little brain, that makes way more sense to have a perfectly white... Is anybody else jiving with me on this? Okay, this doesn't make sense to have a red cow that's without blemish because by the mere fact that it's red, it's connected to sin, which is blemished. This is the paradox that the rabbis cannot figure out is, is not necessarily why it's red, but why is it that, uh, that the very sacrifice that cleanses all of Israel disqualifies and makes the priest that's operating and officiating this unclean? The very sacrifice that makes people clean makes those that started out clean unclean. How can that happen? We're going to talk about that. And we're going to give that near, near the end. I'm going to go through that. But why wouldn't it be a white heifer? This is the paradox. Red represents sin and death, while white represents truth and life. You see, what the rabbis have not connected is that the red heifer had to be red. Why? It's taking on all of the sins of Israel and the uncleanliness of Israel. It cannot be white. White is purity and perfection. You don't burn something that's perfect. But it's perfect. You see the paradox? It's a perfect heifer, but it's red, which in, 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 in nomenclature according to the scriptures, red is connected to sin. So technically, we're burning sin outside the camp. 
Let's continue. The red heifer is handed over to the high priest before the sacrifice for examination. Yeshua was handed over to Caiaphas, the high priest, for examination. Why did he be handed over for examination? Why did he have to go through that in the middle of the night? Because that's exactly what was required for the red heifer sacrifice to be qualified. It had to be taken over to the high priest. They would lead the heifer outside the city gate to the Mount of Olives to be sacrificed. Yeshua was led out of the same gate to be the same location to be sacrificed. No priestly qualifications were required to burn the red heifer. No priestly, only had to be a clean person. It did not have to be a priest. So that's so interesting because if the Torah would have required a priest, it would have disqualified him as, as a red heifer sacrifice because the Romans were the ones that killed him. Do you see that? If the Jews would have uh, killed him, it, excuse me, if, if the Torah would have required a priest to kill the red heifer, to burn the red heifer, disqualified. Everything would, all the way up to the stake would not have mattered. The moment that that Roman hit that, that nail in the hand, it would have disqualified Yeshua as being the high priest, excuse me, the red heifer. Every detail, according to the scriptures, is prophesied comes true. Don't tell me there's no God. This is about as, di as divine and mathematically impossible for all of these prophecies to line up in such incredible detail. Now see, here's what's amazing. You know, I, I deal with atheists every once in a while, and you guys do too, and I was a former apologist, and so I deal with them all the time, but the reality is, is that we as, as, as Christian apologists loved to focus on all of the, the, the prophecies like he was going to be born of a virgin, and he was going to be born in Bethlehem, which is Bethlehem, meaning house of bread. Go figure. The bread of life would be born in a place called the house of bread. And, and, and that all of these, these basic, very easy to see prophecies, the most powerful prophecies, ladies and gentlemen, that prove that our Bible and our God is real, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is still on his throne and looking down, is these kind of prophecies that are found in the front of the book in incredible detail. This is one single chapter of your Bible, and look how many connections that we're making. We had to sprinkle the blood towards the temple seven times. Why not five and a half? Why not six? Why not four? Here's why, because it was one for every single day of the week and one for every millennial day. It's one for each of the thousand years of mankind. When Adam sinned, what happened? It caused every single man, woman, and child from that moment on to have sin, to be born into an unclean lifestyle, an unclean state. Does that make sense? Every generation for the next seven days, if you will, a day is a thousand years, would be unclean. So it's incredible to me to understand that the red heifer sacrifice, they sprinkled the blood seven times towards the temple, one for every day of creation. Every day that Adam screwed up and messed up would be made clean all the way to the 7,000th year. The curtain must be opened during the sacrifice for the sacrifice to be valid. One of the very last things that has to happen. And so the curtain, this is a problem, big problem. Yeshua dies on the cross and pretend that you're a believer sitting there and you reading the, okay, wait, whoa, the doors are closed. Can't be the red heifer sacrifice. The doors have to be open. You see, in, in, the, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, there were two curtains, one at the front of the gate, the front of the tent of meeting, and one into the Holy of Holies that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. In, in the second temple times, it was a real building structure, and you had the temple doors, and then you had the curtain that was about halfway through, same thing, that, that split uh, the holy place from the Holy of Holies. This curtain was ripped from top to bottom by what? An earthquake. Did you know that the stone that was on top holding this curtain was 30 tons? 30 tons. I don't have a clue how they, they did that. Probably the same people that built the, 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 whatever those things are called, pyramids. 30 tons comes falling to the ground. That would get everybody a, a little bit of a wake. And so guess what? The requirement for the Torah is that the high priest would have to look into the Holy of Holies. He would have to look into the Holy of Holies for it to be a valid sacrifice. 
Now, why would the high priest or any priest or anybody remotely that's up there watching him on a cross turn their head and look into the Holy of Holies when the doors are shut and it's a completely different scene over there? If there wasn't a major noise, a major earthquake, the doors fly open, huge 30-ton rock falls to the floor, rips open this massive... By the way, that curtain is about as high as this entire... Here, about 30 feet. Rips the curtain in half... And everyone's looking right into the temple, not knowing into the Holy of Holies. They're validating the red heifer sacrifice. Now, why would they have to look into the Holy of Holies? You know what the word before is in Hebrew there? I don't have time to go through this. But the word before there in Hebrew is the word face. Before the Lord is looking directly into his face. Now, why is that so important? Because, my friends, the son of the living God is on a stake with a cedar beam, most likely on an almond tree, the tree of life, and his face is looking directly into the eyes of his father. And his father turns his head. You see, that's what's going on. You can't turn your head unless you're looking into someone's eyes. Remember the scriptures where it says, well, you've turned your back on me. You can't, see, we look at that metaphorically as Yahweh's everywhere. Not according to the red heifer sacrifice, the face of Yahweh is in the holy of holies. He's looking directly into the eyes of his son, and he must turn his head because of the crimson red that he's become. Why was it a red heifer sacrifice and not a blue one? Because Yeshua, according to all the ancient sources, was full of blood. From head to toe, he was ripped to shreds. Nothing but blood. The movie that Mel Gibson did, very, very close, I believe, to the correct rendition of what Yeshua probably looked like. He looked crimson red. Again, another connection. It is not until the ashes of the red heifer are combined with living water that it brings forth life because they had to take the ashes of the red heifer and they would wait, they would put the ashes in a jar and guess how many days they'd have to sit and wait? Three. Three days the ashes of the red heifer would have to be in a clean place. Then they would take the ashes and they would, they would, they would put it inside living, clean water. And it was at that moment on the third day that they would begin to sprinkle it on the people. And it was on the third day and on the seventh day they were declared clean. In the same way, if you ever wondered where baptism comes from or immersion or what we call being you know, mikvah uh, ever came from, it's because when you are immersed into the death of, of Yeshua the Messiah, you are connecting the death of Yeshua with living water. He's the red heifer sacrifice, my friends, until you are mikvahed. Like John said, I came to just to baptize you with water, but he will baptize you in water and what? Fire. Why would John say that? Was it just a stroke of genius? What fire is he talking about? What is the writer of Hebrews talking about? The red heifer sacrifice is burned, fire and water. What are the three elements of the earth? Anybody know? I'll give you one, fire, water, and air. Is that right? Now you got me second guessing myself up here. Fire, water, and air. Do you know that all three of those work together? You can't have fire without what? Air. And what do you put fire out with? Water. They all work together. The spiritual realm, good and evil, all works within that. So you have the fire of the red heifer sacrifice. You have the living water, which is connected to what? The Word. And you have the air, which in Hebrew is what? 
Ruach, which is connected to the Spirit. You have to have all three. You have to have the death of Messiah mixed with the living water of the Word, and you must be baptized in His Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. Good, now we can continue. It continues, more connections. The Kohen, or the priest, in Hebrew it's called the Kohen, took a piece of cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson wool, bound them together and cast them into the fire of the sacrifice. Yeshua was crucified on a cedar beam, was given sour wine on a hyssop branch, and was forced to wear a crimson robe. Now let me ask a question that maybe you haven't asked. How do they make crimson wool? What is wool made out of? By the blood of the Lamb? That should mean something so much more to you because they would take wool and they would dip it in red dye. So literally, what's happening here is that you have the, the crimson robe that is put on Yeshua is prophetic of what's getting ready to happen where he would be completely covered in blood himself. He is the Lamb of God wearing lamb. How do you, you can't get any more, what do I always say? The spiritual is connected to what? The physical. The physical is a picture of the spiritual. Whatever's happening in your life right now, whatever's happening in your life right now in the physical world, there is a spiritual message. It doesn't matter what's happening. There's a spiritual message. Yeshua is wearing a robe that is crimson. Wool dipped in red dye. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and He is crucified on the Mount of Olives just north and directly east looking into the, the Holy of Holies satisfying every single Scripture according to the Scripture to be the red heifer sacrifice. The ashes were then gathered and taken to a clean place and newly hewn stone. It, it just doesn't end. Yeshua, when he died, was placed in a newly hewn stone of Joseph of Arimathea. Brand new tomb. Do you know that, that the red heifer hash ashes were put into a mini tomb? I wish I had a picture of it. It looks just like, like a, a little stone shelf. It's a tomb, which is exactly what the tombs look like. It's amazing. Continue the connections. The ashes would remain in the clean place until the third day, then they would be used for cleansing. And I went through that. Yeshua rose on the third day, was mixed with the Spirit on Shavuot in earthly vessels. And so when the Torah commandment in Numbers chapter uh, 19 says that they were to take the ashes of the red heifer, mix it with the clean water, and sprinkle it on the people on the third day, and on the seventh day they would become clean, what is that saying to us? It's saying that, they, it, that you cannot be clean until the third day, and the third day is the gospel. The gospel of Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, is the death, burial, and resurrection of the red heifer sacrifice, the Yom Kippur sacrifice, the Passover lamb, all of it wrapped into one, and that you must be sprinkled by that gospel, the good news of the red heifer sacrifice. Amen? When you are sprinkled on the third day, meaning that you accepted the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, and you are walking in His ways, and shall I add, all of His ways, on the seventh day, you will be mikvahed again. But this time, it will be directly by Him. Have you ever wondered why He comes back on the Mount of Olives? Why does he come back on the Mount of Olives? He could have come back on Mount Moriah. That would have been a logical place. But he comes back and splits the Mount of Olives in two. Why does he come back to the Mount of Olives? Not just because that's where his son, that's where he died. That is the place of Golgotha, the counting of the census. That is the entrance into the city, my friends, is through that gate. What did Yeshua say? I am the way. Where? Logical question, the way to where? 
to my Father. No one goes to the Father except through me. Where's the Father if you're a first century Hebrew? They're not going to go, he's up in the sky. The Father is in the Holy of Holies. Everybody knows that. He's even got a throne. And there just happens to be a gate that's very, very narrow that runs across the valley with all of the death underneath it. And the counting of the census starts here. Nobody goes across that valley unless you pass by him first. It's so amazing. They passed by him the first time when he was dying. Some spit in his face. The second time that he comes, he will be the one doing the census. Sprinkling was to happen on the third day and the seventh day. The first red heifer was in the third millennium. Can you believe that? It's amazing. Our God is so incredible. He thought of everything. I mean, if, there, if that wasn't enough connections, the third millennium is when the first sacrifice is made, the first red heifer. There's been seven red heifers that have been sacrificed from the very beginning. And the number eight means what in Hebrew? New beginnings. Yeshua will be coming back at the millennium number seven. So here's the great mystery. How can the very ceremony of the red heifer that is designed to make one clean make those who officiate it unclean at the same time? Very simple. Galatians 3.10 tells us the, the answer. For as many as are the works of the Torah are under the curse. In other words, if you're relying on the Torah only to save you, you are under a curse. Why? Because everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You break the Torah. Sin is a transgression of the Torah. You break the Torah. You're under a curse. And if you're relying on the Torah or your works alone, you will continually be under that curse. For written is cursed everyone that continues not in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, if you do not do everything perfect in the Torah, you're under a curse. So Yeshua didn't come to get rid of the curse. He came, excuse me, get rid of the law. He came to get rid of the curse. Yeshua became the curse for us. The red heifer becomes, starts out perfect, unblemished, and it ends up totally unclean. That's why anybody that touches that red heifer becomes unclean. Every priest, every high priest, and even the children, which some of them were grown as little children, to be the one that would scoop up the ashes of the red heifer because they had 100% fact knowledge that this child was clean because they had watched him, like the golden child. Okay, That's reality. This is the great paradox, or what... what in Orthodox Judaism, they say is the greatest mystery in all of the scriptures. This is what they say is the greatest mystery. They even have a tradition to say that Solomon understood all things. But this was the only thing that Solomon could not figure out. Was what is, how is it that something so perfect could make everyone else clean, but the ones that are officiating, the high priest, would become unclean. Yeshua in the same way, perfect, unblemished, absolutely sinless became unclean. And he became the high priest as well that same day. Isn't that amazing? And he had to go three days. Why did he have to go three days? Because three days was the number that it took before the sacrifice would go from unclean to clean. He couldn't raise on the second day. It wouldn't be ready. He would be still unclean. And guess what he shows up with on the third day as clothing? A white robe. Because he had been mikvahed in the word of Yahweh. He had fulfilled every word. So when it says, wash in the water of the word, it doesn't mean just go home and read your Bible. It means that every prophecy concerning Yeshua the Messiah came true. He was washed in the water of the Word. If you don't believe that you're a Hebrew, and you don't understand Romans 11 and Ephesians 2, I encourage you to get 
and watch Identity Crisis so you know who you really are because all of the prophecies in the Old Testament that are about His people are about you. You are Israel. You are grafted into the olive tree, and the olive tree in Jeremiah 11 is Israel. If you don't know that, you're not being washed properly in the water of the Word because all of the prophecies are about you. Is this making sense? As Rico would say, we need to shake ourselves. That was still a horrible accent. I need to work on it. <laughs> Hebrews 9 says this, For if the blood of bulls and goats, and I started with this and we're going to end with this, and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, even the rabbi, Shaul, if he's the one that wrote the book of Hebrews, understood that Yeshua was the red heifer. Can you imagine being a first century Jew, growing up knowing the Torah? Do you know Paul had all 39 books memorized word for word? Had to, to be a student of Gamaliel. And he says that he was zealous more than, he was the best student of Gamaliel. So who knows what he had memorized and everything that he had put together. If you knew everything to Paul, can you imagine the connections he was making? No wonder he was so passionate about what he did. Do you have passion for what you do? Let me just stop for a moment. There are some of you that are listening to me right now that you have no passion in your life. You have no passion for truth. Yeah, that would be a really good name for a ministry, actually. Some of you need to be infused with the water of the word and the ruach and then actually add the power of the word in truth to make you come alive from your dead state. Some of you have been living in the walls of religion your whole entire life. Some of you have just been living. Some of you actually been studying the word. You know the word, but you're not alive. You don't have any passion inside of you. You can't know the God of the living universe and put together the connections that we're making and not get excited. Sometimes I feel like I need to go to an African-American church so I can hear someone say amen. amen. <laughs> they know how to say amen. Amen? amen. <laughs> Come on now. We need some passion. Everything happens on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4 says, And his feet shall stand, this is right when the Messiah comes back, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of thereof toward the east and towards the west. That means split. And there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove towards the north and the other half towards the south. Now watch this in verse 16. It says this. This is when the Messiah comes back, for those of you that don't believe, that the Torah is for today. And he meant what he said the first time. He says, It shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh Zebaot, and shall keep the feast of tabernacles, Sukkot. And it shall be that whoever does not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh Zebaot, even unto them shall be no rain. Folks, we have seven feast days that we're supposed to honor. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know exactly how to honor them. But how do we know how to honor anybody or anything? By trying to honor them. You do your best to honor them according to what the Scriptures say. Sukkot is coming up. Some of you will not take it serious. Maybe you're not that in your journey yet. You don't see that. That's okay. But for those of you that believe in it, you should believe in it. Because what, the way that I read my Bible is that at some day, at some point, in some time, it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah. And they were protected when they were Sukkoting, if you will. They were already out of the city when the lights got turned off. Someday it could be very possible that something might happen in this world and Yahweh protects those that are all 
ready, honoring him. And that's for a whole other message and another time and another place. So let's end by asking this. Why is the red heifer so important for us today? Why is it so important? Because prophetically, we want to go to Daniel chapter 9. We want to go to all these different scriptures in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Revelation. And that's great. Every one of those, we have to understand. We need to know. I study those. I want to understand those. They're part of the puzzle. But folks, we have a third temple that's coming. You realize that. Yeshua does not come back until the third temple is desecrated by the Antichrist. During the daily sacrifice, it has to be stopped. We know that. The daily sacrifice must be stopped by the Antichrist. Everybody understand that, right? According to the Torah, you can't have a temple without the red heifer sacrificed first. Because the red heifer sacrifice is what makes all of the priests clean to officiate the daily sacrifice. Is this making sense? So we should not be looking for them to start sacrificing lambs. We should look for the birth of the red heifer. Do we have a red heifer alive today? You know who this is? This is Rabbi Chaim Richman. And they're going to play this uh, MP3 for me. The bombshell I wanted to mention is the fact so that let's hear what he has because to everyone say. is very interested in the status of the red heifer, people speculate, people remember the excitement of when a red heifer was born, people talk about it, and the reason for that, of course, why there's such excitement every time everybody, anybody mentions a red heifer is because uh, a lot of people know that there is a Jewish tradition, it's in the Mishnah, that there were only nine red heifers throughout the entire history of um, the Jewish people. And there were nine red heifers that were, and the ashes from those red heifers were enough to accomplish the process of cleansing for all the generations of the, of the people of Israel. And there is a tradition that the tenth red heifer is the one that's associated with the rebuilding of the third temple. That's why when there's a news report about a red heifer being born, people get very, very excited. It's looked on as some sort of a wake-up call like that. And I wanted to share with our listeners far and wide mm-hmm. the fact that there is definitely a kosher red heifer here. This right is now. really uh, breaking news. Yes, it is. This should be on a, a, a scroll on it the bottom be. of a CNN or something. It should be. We're not making a lot of noise about it. We're not. We're not taking out all sorts of ads, and we're not. Uh, certainly not disclosing the location. That's definitely not prudent, and I'm not going to be sharing it with the United States Embassy. Absolutely not. But you should know that there are definitely. In fact, I think there's more than one, but there is definitely at least one kosher red heifer here in Israel right now, so that is not what is impeding the process at all. That's a great encouragement, source of uh, comfort, I think, but again, it's also a reminder that uh, we have our work cut out for us, and uh, the days are passing, and uh, you know we have to keep on with it and, and keep working toward our goal. Folks, did you hear what he said? This is of last year, early of 2010. That is the biggest bombshell breaking news that you could ever hear that hit your ears is that there is a kosher red heifer. And did he say more than one? And they're not disclosing the location. Good idea. If that's the case and they, and they announced this one year ago, then that means that that red heifer is probably close to three years old. It has to be three years old. See, if they just said, oh, it was born today, I wouldn't be so excited. Because they can't even call it a kosher red heifer that qualifies to be a red heifer sacrifice until it's older. But now that it's nearing the age of of being validated, they have come out and they have said, this is a kosher red heifer. So folks, if this is a validated kosher red heifer, and it is nearing the process of three years old, and all of the utensils in the altar are already built for the temple and ready for the sacrificial system of the third temple, then everything is in place. The only thing needed is permission for them to start making the sacrifices. Today, how this relates to you and I is, first of all, we need to read our Bibles. We need to understand 
the front of the book and how it relates to the back of the book because the Messiah is written everywhere. And we went literally, we talked about one single chapter in the, in the Tanakh. I want to encourage each and every one of you, if you are feeling, this is just totally different, but if you are feeling unclean, then you need to get mikvahed. Do you know what that means? That means that you need to go back to the beginning. What was the beginning? The red heifer sacrifice, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Messiah, and you need to get right with Him. You need to get His blood flowing through your veins because where is life? In the blood. If you feel like you are encompassed by death, then you do not have enough blood of the Messiah running through your veins. You need more of His Ruach breathing in your lungs. Let us remember that not only is Yeshua the Messiah been resurrected and coming back, but He desires to resurrect each and every one of us out of our situation of uncleanliness. He is trying to get ready His bride and clean His bride up. We are at the point of the census right now. And let me prophetically say something. We've always said, if you don't learn it once, what is he going to do? Take you around that mountain again. Can I tell you something that's in my spirit? There is no more mountain. This is it. This is your chance to make things right before your king. He is making a census. Those that pass the sentence, census go forward. Those that are not get left behind. Be one that, is, that prospers in his word and is worthy to be called into these last days ministries. Don't be left behind. It's going to be an exciting ride. Amen? Amen. Please raise to your feet. Please stand and let's pray.